I invite you to pray with me. Gracious God, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to stand on holy ground. We know, God, wherever your presence is, that ground is sacred and holy, and we are grateful for this opportunity to do so as we gather around your word on your ground. May the words of my mouth and all of our thoughts and prayers be pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. As we come to an end of another school year, it's telling, I think, to just pause and reflect on how our religious holidays and our school year are connected, at least to some extent. We have two real, I mean, big, big societally recognized high holy days in, in the church year, Christmas and Easter. Right? Mother's Day is in there too, right? We have Christmas and Easter. Uh, Pentecost notwithstanding today. And it's true that, that the school kind of works itself around those two major religious days. The spring break is paired with Easter and either before or after Easter frequently. And, and the longest break of the year outside of summer comes over Christmas. So we see how our calendar is influenced by our religious holidays for the Jewish people in Jesus' day, the same could be said, though religious festivals and agriculture were paired, intricately paired. So this was an agrarian society, lots of farming going on, and because of the climate, some grain, vegetable, or fruit could be harvested nine months of the year. Nine months of the year, something was being harvested. For example, barley. Barley was planted at the end of the fall, and then it was harvested the following spring. And after the barley harvest in the spring, the people held a religious festival, because that's what you did after the harvest. You thanked God for the blessings of the harvest. And so people for the, the barley harvest uh, would bring their first fruits as an offering of thanksgiving to God. And this barley harvest had a name, a very functional, pragmatic name, the Festival of Weeks. W-E-E-K-S, the Festival of Weeks. <laughs> Let's say pragmatic. Uh, because it was always held not only after the barley harvest, but seven weeks after Passover, which was another religious festival in the springtime. So the festival of weeks, every spring after the barley harvest, people bringing their first fruits to God. And many people would come to the, the capital city, Jerusalem, to celebrate the festival there. Number one, the temple was there, and you could bring your offering to the temple, to God's house. But also, it's just the place to be. Right? It's the place you want to be where everybody else is. And so it has a kind of a self-fulfilling prophetic effect. Some people go, then everybody wants to go. Everybody wants to go because everybody's going there. And the end effect was that people from all over the area would be there. Now, they were all Jewish, but they might be representing different ethnicities, different cultures, speaking different languages, all converging on Jerusalem for the Festival of Weeks. Well, one year, one year during the Festival of Weeks, after the barley harvest was the same year that Jesus rose from the tomb. Now we know that 40 days after Jesus rose from the tomb, he ascended into heaven to sit at the right hand of God. Now before all that happened, before Jesus died, before he rose, before he ascended into heaven, he pulled his followers aside and he said, told him what was going to happen. I'm going to leave you, but don't worry. Right? Do not be frightened. Do not be dismayed. I'm, I'm going to be leaving you, but God is going to send you the Holy Spirit, which is going to be your assurance that God is with you in the absence of my body. So the Holy Spirit would be the presence of God in the absence of Christ, the comforter, the assurance that God was there. Now, all of this happened in Jerusalem, too. 
Jesus died in Jerusalem, was buried in Jerusalem, rose in Jerusalem, and ascended into, into heaven in Jerusalem, the very same city where people were gathering for the festival. At the very same time, people were gathering for the festival of weeks, the barley harvest. And 10 days after Jesus ascended into heaven, the 50th day after Easter, as the festival was in full swing, something really important happened. And that's our scripture reading today. It comes to us from Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. And it goes like this. When the day of Pentecost had come, all the followers of Jesus were together in one place. And suddenly, from heaven, there, there came a sound, like, like, like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each one of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to, to speak other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven staying in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd came together and was bewildered because each one of them heard the followers of Jesus speaking in their own native language. A amazed and astonished, they said to one another, are not all of these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that we hear each of us in the native language of each? The word of God for the people of God. That's just verses 1 through 7. That story goes on for another 34 verses, right? But this is the story of what happened. And what happened on that day during that festival of weeks after that barley harvest in that springtime of the year was that God sent the Holy Spirit just as Jesus promised God would do. And that Spirit came to the followers like a mighty wind strong and powerful, like a fire with heat and energy. That fire and wind of the Holy Spirit came upon everyone and filled everything. All the followers were together in one house. Must have been a big house. And nobody was excluded. Everybody was included. Everybody was touched and filled. And once they had this Holy Spirit... They had the ability to communicate in a universal way. Every nation under heaven, every language under heaven was represented in the crowd. And everybody heard the gospel that the followers were speaking in a way that was clear and unmistakable. And so because of that day, every year since... On the 50th day after Easter, we celebrate, not the Festival of Weeks, but Pentecost. Pentecost, that's today. I know Tina and I and Don are, are highly consumed by this, about counting days and weeks. You're, you might not be as much, but if you're counting, today is the 50th day after Easter 2018, which was April 1st. This is seven weeks after Easter, and every year, seven weeks after Easter, we celebrate Pentecost. And that word Pentecost, incidentally, literally just means 50. 50, so that's where we get the 50 days after Easter. But we celebrate this every year to remember that through the Holy Spirit, the gospel of Jesus Christ is strong and powerful and mighty and sustaining and life-giving and it is for everyone, and nobody is to be left out of this spirit. Right? But there was something else that happened of note on that first Pentecost that is important for us today as well. And that is that the followers of Jesus were changed after 
the Holy Spirit came upon them in a very real way. So, so take Peter, for example, the disciple Peter. Before Pentecost, Peter was, oh, bumbling and stumbling a bit. We don't criticize him for that. There, but for the grace of God, we would go. But Peter bumbled and stumbled a bit. He had good intentions, but would often say the wrong thing or couldn't get out of his own way. But after the, the Holy Spirit came upon him, he's bold, he's clear, he's confident. If you go on and read in Acts chapter 2, you'll see that the next thing that happens is that Peter gives the first Christian sermon. And it is so good that 3,000 people convert as soon as it's done. Right? Like that, that's the bar. <laughs> that's a high bar for any preacher right, to come up against. Different, before, after. Or take the disciple John before the, the Holy Spirit came. John was kind of in the background, shy, maybe timid. We don't hear him say much. After the Holy Spirit, though, he's courageous. He goes right to the steps of the temple and starts preaching that Jesus really rose from the dead and that he is our salvation. And the temple priest thought it was too loud. They didn't like the message he was preaching, so they had him arrested and thrown in jail. But Scripture says that 2,000 more people heard him preach on the steps and were so convicted by his courage that he would go to prison on behalf of his faith that they converted that day different before and after or take the disciple James before the Holy Spirit James maybe hot-headed Jesus called him the son of thunder maybe he had a, had a, had a temper he was selfish he demanded that Jesus give him the prized position in the kingdom of heaven. But after the Holy Spirit, he's wise, mature. In the early, he became the, the leader of the Jerusalem church. And early in the days of that church, there was a conflict. I know, perish the thought, a church with a conflict. But there, there was a conflict in the church, and the church was in danger of, of fracturing. But he, with his maturity and wisdom, helped hold it together and chart the course for the church's future and keep everybody at one? Different before and after. It was as almost as though the disciples had a three-year internship with Jesus, a, a three-year formal education, and the world was their classroom. Jesus would walk everywhere, and, and he would stop and point to different things. He'd, he'd point to a mustard seed or a fishing boat, or a tax collecting booth, or a, a field of wheat, and he would use that object to teach a lesson about God's kingdom. And, and honestly, sometimes the disciples aced the quizzes that Jesus gave them. Right? And sometimes, like us, not so much. C's and D's on the pop quizzes. But, but something happened when the Holy Spirit came upon them that changed them. It was almost as though the hands of Jesus were on them to say, you're ready. You're ready now. You've been prepared. You've been equipped. And now with the Holy Spirit, you are empowered to take the next step, to face your future, and to live into your purpose. They still struggled. They still stumbled. Life without Jesus was much harder than it was with him. But it was as though the Holy Spirit was God's reminder that Jesus did his part in your life. And it's okay that he's gone because you're ready to leave now. And you can do it because my assurance, my presence, my power and strength is with you in the Holy Spirit. And I think it's very appropriate that we celebrate Graduation Sunday on a day like Pentecost. Because the word graduate is based on a Latin word. Nice that we had a Latin um, anthem today. Because the Latin word for graduate or graduate is a Latin word greatest that means step, step. That's what graduation is, taking a step. Or commencement, we think of commencement with graduation, commences to begin. So a day like graduation Sunday is a day to remember that our graduates and, and those who are matriculating in a formal education process are ready to begin the next step on their journey. People for like uh, those who are graduating with diplomas, like Seth, maybe, maybe going on to a, a brand new venture, a new experience, much different than the one he's had. 
others like uh, Thomas or, or Caden, uh, you know, Reese, these others, Zach, Mackenzie, maybe they're graduating to a new school or graduating to a new classroom, a new teacher, right? And a day like graduation Sunday is a day to say you're ready. You've been prepared and equipped, and we celebrate that right? and send you off to take your next step. But, but more importantly, Pentecost is a day to remember that for all of us, whether school is way, way in the rearview mirror or whether it's just in our recent past, that all of us are ready. We're ready for the next step on our journey of faith. We're ready to take that. Now, I don't know what the next step on your journey is. We all have different journeys, and the step for you may not be the step for your neighbor or for me. Maybe the next step for you is, is a step of confrontation. You know, you've been avoiding something that you hoped would take care of itself, but, but God is really asking you to, to step forward boldly and embrace that openly and honestly. Or maybe the next step for you is a step in a new direction, a brand new direction that you've been hesitant to take because of whatever reason, fear, apprehension. Or maybe the next step for you is a step backward in the sense that there's something in your past that needs to be resolved or addressed before you can go forward in a real healthy way. I don't know what the step is for you, but today is a day to remember that like Peter and John and James experienced and those early followers on that 50th day after the first Easter, that we're ready. Pentecost is a reminder that we're ready. God is with us, and whatever the step is for you, you should have the confidence and courage to take that step with boldness. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for equipping us and empowering us and sending us forth to address that next step on our journey. We trust that you are with us and will give us every resource and every encouragement to do that in a way that is beneficial not only to us, but to you and your kingdom. In your holy name we pray. Amen.